Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, Jukebox Jack's podcast, episode nine. This one has been penciled in for a while, and it's something that both uh, me and Michelle have been talking about. We're both really passionate about mental health issues, mental health conditions, people's struggles along the way. Um, and we're quite fortunate today that Michelle's actually taking some time out of a busy day to uh, talk about her personal journey, her personal story of what she's been through. And I guarantee quite a lot of people are going to be able to relate to uh, to a story of varying things that she's gone through in a time. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, nice to see you. Um, how uh, how has your day been so far? I know we're on different time schedules. <laughs> Pretty good. I haven't done too much today. The weather's really, really, really nice today. So I was outside. Yeah. Yeah, those people after uh, after checking this episode out, if you do actually end up following uh, Michelle on uh, social media, she has some of the most beautiful scenery around her. She's got lakes, mountains. Um, those people that may or may not be able to tell straight away from her, from her accent, she's uh, she's based in Canada. So uh, at times, a signal may vary, and we might freeze on each other's sides. But we'll uh, we're just going to run with it, and we're just going to see uh, see how far this conversation goes before we have technical issues that we have on every episode, as it is. Um, yeah. So um, just give us an introduction about yourself. Um, obviously, what you're doing now, and then we'll we'll work backwards along the way. All right, so I'm Michelle, and I'm 29 years old, and I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug addict. And I also suffer from mental health disorders. So we call that a concurrent disorder. And um, right now, I'm just dealing with that because I really, it's only been, I just got out of rehab when COVID hit. So uh it's just um well yeah i kind of moved up climb close to the north pole they say but it's <laughs> the middle middle of nowhere in the <laughs> during this time staying in silver yeah so. i was gonna say i'd imagine obviously of all kind of times to be coming out of you know a rehab situation right in the middle of a pandemic a global pandemic at that as well um i suppose it's one of the message messages that you tell to yourself you know if i can get through this part of what i've gone through then i can pretty much get through anything kind of thing oh i do and i tell people that all the time on social media who also got sober i'm like man if we could get sober in 2020 you can do anything <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because it were um, I've I've spoke about it with different varying guests that I've had. There were there were so many that you you'd probably say strong people that you'd see around you in your friend circle that you'd never think would be dealing with anything, and it's just crept up on them, even them during the like the pandemic, and that's kind of where this whole um, concept came from, just as a way of everybody communicating. Even the with each other. In general. You should see, I was reading um, statistics the other day, don't have them memorized, but um, the substance abuse that's gone on during COVID just in the health field for like health, like nurses, um, a lot of like lab technicians. Yeah, yeah we've, uh, we've had a lot of that over, over here with the, uh, the NHS that uh, a lot of uh, nursing staff, yeah. even in the mental, health, uh, mental health um, sector, they've... Um, they've now themselves gone off with you know depression uh, stress related conditions yeah. all brought on through obviously the pandemic itself um so yeah, it yeah. Is, it's this is this is where as best as possible i always try and tell people that you know we are in this together irrespective of if you've got any knowledge of of any illnesses any conditions substance abuse um we, we can all be there for each other, especially in your friend circle. You can be checking on your friends, helping wherever possible. Exactly. Exactly. So I, um, yeah. it's, it's a good few months ago now, but I, uh, I caught an episode that you were on of a, uh, of a different podcast and it was really enlightening to, for me to obviously learn a lot more about you, about what you'd been through uh, from a, very early age um 
Yeah, do you want to do you want to start with um, right from uh, right from the beginning? Um, I believe it was like four year old. Yeah, like I I can start from yeah. I guess I can go back to four. Uh, that's when they say that I. That's when the doctors now, when they look back into my medical uh, records, they say that I started getting PTSD and ADD. Um, I was a very active child, though. Um, I was a competitive figure skater and uh, actually a Canadian gold medalist. Um, oh, wow. So I was well, very active. Um, but then I'd say by, so it was 11. 11 was when I just guess I felt really uncomfortable in my own skin and started feeling just. That's when I guess now that I look back on it, PTSD was coming out and anxiety was coming out. Um, but at as 11 year old, you don't know. Um, I had lots of stomach problems, which is a huge clue for kids when they have um, anxiety. And I was sent to like every specialist you could imagine. But I mean, children and anxiety wasn't even known back then. This was in the 90s, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, just even in the 90s, it wasn't even known, right? <laughs> that wasn't a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I guess when I, by 11, I'd already started like 11. I dragged my time, tried cigarettes, weed, prescription meds, just basically when I started trying different things. Um, and then 17, I mean, I went through a bunch of stuff between 11 and 17, obviously. I had the PTSD, ADD, and anxiety, which were not diagnosed. And so what happens is when you're suffering from those for such a long period of time, you actually develop depression. Yeah. So, um, I was now developing depression and um, I was self-medicating, right? Because I didn't know what was going on in my brain. I was going to doctors and they didn't know. Um, so at 17, I went to, my mom took me to my family doctor for my first withdrawal. Um, and I was prescribed out of van, 90 pills out of van to a 17 year old. He's just coming off of another a drug, like I just I'm coming off MDMA elsewhere. And he just threw me another met, you know, it was one drug to another. His doctor, the doctor didn't know what to do. Um so that was just like one drug from another. And then I got into um opiates, and that was um I guess. I'm very thankful I wasn't in, I did op opiates when there was no, like fentanyl wasn't in the scene. Um, thankful I, that was, I got over it. Um, I had a boyfriend at the time and his mom worked for um, an addictions, uh, like I didn't, what was it called? It's, like York, it's an addiction center, I guess, to get help. And they've got social workers, addiction counselors. And so she hooked up, my boyfriend, uh, who ended up being my fiance, uh, to go to rehab, and I went to detox, and we got off opiates together, and um, I was clean for about two, three, no, three years, and then um, my fiance passed away, and uh, I went to the car scene, and even though I was sober for two years. I didn't learn any coping skills or I wasn't diagnosed with anything or I was guessing I was in the pink cloud, but I guess it could be more manageable when you're stuck in the pink cloud with someone else. Yeah. Uh, when he died, like I had no coping skills. I was in the pink cloud. Didn't want to go back to drugs. So I went and got my first bottle of alcohol. And honestly, I was over, so I don't know what the age is in the UK for drinking, but in Canada, it's 19. And so I was 21 at this time, and I didn't even drink before this. Um, like, I went clubbing, but I always got sick when I drank. <laughs> but I went to the 
Ipo and I grabbed like a 40 and I just chugged it back and I drank every day since he died. And I was just like purely numbing myself because I still had depression, um, PTSD from when I was four. And then now it's turned into complex PTSD. So I had PTSD from when I was four, um, PTSD from the car accident going to the scene, uh, PTSD. Um, and then when I was an alcoholic during my like alcoholic time, I put myself in a lot of dangerous situations. Um, and this was when my depression was like at its worst. Yeah. So I was drinking, which is a depressant, and then attempting suicide every week. Um, so I was just, yeah, the drinking just exuberated, I guess you could say, all the symptoms of everything. So the PTSD, I have four incidents of, for, that caused PTSD. And during alcohol, when I was an alcoholic, um, I did, there was a rape. And also um, my best friend died beside me, but I was not with it enough to save him, even though I had the hand kit. So that was another thing that caused. So there's just like a lot of building of trauma that is never dealt with. And then... By the time I was drinking, it was just coming out when I was drinking. And like, I didn't even know how to do anything sober. Like, I didn't know anything emotional wise. <laughs> um, and so like, it got so bad. I was drinking. I was drinking at work. Like it was uh, like every day. And if I didn't wake up at three, I think it was between two and three o'clock in the morning, I would have a seizure because then I'd be going through my withdrawals. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, and I was, you thought it was a coffee cup at work. It definitely wasn't. And working for doctors, they did clue on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of people obviously listening to just, I mean, and, and it literally is, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg of everything that you've been through. Um, a lot of people that even to this day still have misconceptions about substance abuse, whether it is alcohol, whether it's drugs, and they just, you know, if they've got no knowledge of it and there are no people within their circle, they're just kind of like, oh, I don't understand why they can't just stop drinking or they can't just stop taking whatever they're taking, but they don't understand the underlying reasons that they're even taking it in the first place, that it's it's another crutch, it's another dependency, it's another addiction they've picked up because they're it's ultimately true. not dealing with other issues that they've got. That was with my family. It's like my mom, she comes from, I get a lot of the dep- like mental health and addiction from my dad's side. So my mom comes from a complete opposite family. And so, I mean, she's done great. She's done a lot of family therapy and stuff. Um, well, she couldn't get that part, right? Like, how can you not just have one drink or whatever? Or how come you're in rehab for alcohol and you're in the bathroom trying to try like, a new drug? Like, what's wrong with you, you know? But she's like, I understood that uh, PTSD survivors, 50% of us are abused a substance to numb dissociation and our self-esteem and... Like, there's no pill on the market specifically for PTSD, right? I mean, for insomnia and, like, some of the side effects of PTSD, you can take meds for, but there's no pill on the market. Google it. There's nothing on there for PTSD, right? So that's a huge number, 50%. And then, I mean, ask children. I always tell people this. Go ask your seven-year-old. Do they know what a coping skill is? And like, people don't have coping skills. So like, how do you expect people to handle any kind of intense emotions, right? Yep, exactly. So. Yeah, and that's it. And that's that's one of the things in, obviously the coming out of the global pandemic, the effects that it's had on children's mental health, the next generation. Um, and again, if, if they haven't had that support network around them at the best of times and then the pandemic hit and 
the fallout from being in school, not being in school, not being able to see the friends because the friends' parents don't want them associating with other children because of the whole threat of the COVID situation. It's a lot of mental strain to put on people or children at, at them age groups as well, where the, their own fully um, understanding of things isn't as set in stone as saying adults would be. But then if they don't have that adult support network around them, it's, yeah, it's creating so many issues. I also think, though, that I'm, this is going to be, yes, this was a lot of negativity, but I have to say, like, I've never heard children's mental health being spoke up about as much as I did during COVID. So, like, maybe, like, kids won't go from 11 to 28 undiagnosed anymore. Like, there's people that are no noticing this. Um, I do work, well, not anymore, not at the moment, but when I did work for the doctor's office and I, we had tablets and we, they had, um, there's certain tests I've, I've shared them actually bad and like PHQ tests, um, that I can take. I take a depression and an anxiety scale weekly just to keep track of my mood. And there's children ones now, and I'm very happy to see. And one of the very first questions is, do you have tummy problems every day at the same time? Like, you know, it's actually yeah. being no now, and kids aren't going to deal with what I dealt with for 17 years. Yeah. Um, when, um, when I was on the, um, the episode with Felix, who's a, uh, is a mental health nurse in the UK, um, mm. that was one of the things that he was saying in terms of any, any future, recommendations that's come from you know where referrals that's come from doctors that's, they've been sent to obviously mental health nursing outpatient wards and such one of the first questions that they'll be asked before anything about the, the child's personality etc will be how old were you when the pandemic occurred because as he said it, there isn't one now but he's got no doubt whatsoever in the in the coming year there'll be an actual term a medical term for those people who suffered mental health issues during the pandemic oh for sure i don't know that at all like uh so yeah like <laughs> grew up in a bubble and then you're gonna shove them out that's how i feel almost i can feel them i'm gonna be a bubble and then i'm actually kind of anxious for this i don't really remember what non-covid world it is so <laughs> i fear these kids <laughs> yeah it's true it's gonna be scary yeah, because um, yeah. obviously things have things have opened up over here in the UK and things, you know, you can go back to cinemas, theatres, places like that. But there's still, I suppose, people maybe not talking about it or admitting it as much. They're a little bit anxious still about even going out because they're just so, it's out of the comfort zone now. For the past two years, they've just spent at home or locally just watching telly with, with the family. They haven't actually spent any time face-to-face -face with the friends, going to a cinema going shopping they've done it all over like zoom like this and it's a little bit daunting at the best of times um so yeah that's that's very yeah. much what's going on in, there's a lot of people don't get me wrong there's a lot of people excited like one of the episodes that i did earlier today we we're talking about the uh music festival download um that one of his friends got to go to um as part of the pilot scheme over in the uk so there is things at normality and there's ways of looking at the positives, but maybe because of my academic side where obviously I'm starting my degree and stuff, I just naturally try and look at any potential avenues where there's going to be problems. So then we can start to shine a light on it more and, and help people through like conversations and obviously even helping diet sort of like divert people to the, to the right channels that they might need to speak to someone about. Yeah, and I also, I sorry, it just came to my head because I was thinking about this and journaling about it the other day. Um, children, because they haven't been out and socializing, and I'm huge on self esteem being a um, major part of mental health disorders and addiction. I think it's like a root cause. And I've always, I really want to know how this is going to affect their self esteem having to like all of a sudden start just having to socialize and never doing it before right so that's one level i really want it's interesting to me I, i'm interested to see 
Yeah, I'm 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 equally as interested about that to see well, you know, even like with my own children and things like that, to see how they're sort of like adapting to coming out of the pandemic and a little bit of normality around them. So yeah, there'll be little things, won't there? Just a simple thing like a birthday party where normally, you know, your parents are friends with the other children's parents and they'll just kind of be like, oh, you know, it's Bethany's party this weekend. So we've got a present and we're going to go without even consulting the child. How are you actually feeling? Do you feel anxious or nervous about going? But instead, they're just kind of yeah. throwing them into them situations without them conversations. Yes, very interesting. Actually, that's funny because I know uh, I was reading about what to do when you have a shy child when it comes to self esteem because their ch- shy child children can have uh, the ones that can be affected a lot and as a young age with self esteem. And so it's almost like we have to treat all the children like that. And so, yes, these conversations role playing almost because kids love imagination and playing house and stuff like that you can role play with them so it's not so they're not so anxious it's more feel like they've done it before so yeah I was reading about that too yeah yeah because it's um I, I, I mean amongst my group of friends and stuff um and family I I've always said that I with my children, I intended to bring them up a certain way. And it, it came from my own childhood that as a child, I didn't feel like I had a voice. And that, would, that wasn't just my family upbringing. I think that was just how it was back in the 80s, leading into the 90s, that your parents, whatever sort of whatever they said, when there were no discussion, I'm the adult, you're the child, you don't know what you want, and this is what's going to be. Whereas I always have brought my children up in a sense of, it doesn't matter that they're my child and I'm the adult. They have a voice that is just as much valid as what my voice is. So they need to be listened to. They need to obviously be given avenues where they can open up and talk. And and it's okay to be feeling however they're feeling, as long as we're openly having conversations and talking as way through whatever they're thinking or feeling. Yes, that's so true. And it's, uh, what was I looking at the other story? I've been really into children, even though I don't have children at all. <laughs> I need my mom. Like, I, I still depend on my mom. <laughs> so uh, I worked about this and uh, I was reading, like, so well, I noticed, like, the first thing about rehab when I was in there is I actually didn't know how to distinguish between how I was feeling. So, like, I sorry I try not to swear but like I used to just say I feel like shit right just not a feeling and then I finally had a addiction nurse be like no I'm not allowing that anymore I need a feeling word I'm like I don't know that's all I always (laughs) have described myself so I actually have a feeling wheel (laughs) I look on the feeling wheel and I'm like I feel but I found a children's one like and it's like uh it was cool it was like color how you feel and then it was like um does your tummy hurt when you're and it's like if you're anxious does your tummy hurt and it had but to have the symptoms too that they could color in ah. and uh saying yeah because that's obviously that's a really because creative 20- way of doing it of obviously a chill of a child opening up in that way of something natural of just a coloring exercise for them that the more inclined to talk about because even simple things, just when you said colouring, then I, I think back to so many conversations I've had with my children when they were when they were colouring a colouring book because they were relaxed, they were feeling open, they were feeling like they could just talk about whatever because we were talking about colouring in a make-believe character that were in book. So there was no rules, so they could just open up. So I think, like you've said there, them little schemes that has, that's done there in helping children to identify how they're feeling, um, but in a adult capacity where obviously adult medical professionals can understand exactly what the child is meaning or referring to rather than them saying the words in that case oh yeah no i'm trying to learn just in case i do have children i know that genetics like most likely my child i will have to keep an eye on and <laughs> i mean they will probably uh, chances are they will have, and I want them to be ready and prepared, have coping skills. So. Yeah, because there's a there's a lot of conversations that 
that I've had with friends who have got children and obviously everybody brings the children up in different the, the children up in different ways and such but it's always stemmed for me back to when oh, I yeah. was a child uh, that you need you need that voice and I think if you if you don't allow your child to be able to to speak about how they're feeling because they, they just feel, don't feel like they can relate to the parents in that sense I suppose that's the way I've I've always brought my children up in that way that yes I'm their I'm the dad when they've done something wrong in that sense just the general to get the full name said to them but anything apart from that I'm the friend and that's how it's always been like my my son always refers every time he he doesn't say my name he says dad very often it's usually mate this mate that in terms of like friends and that's the relationship that he's always kind of had with me in that sense it's awesome honestly because i'm the opposite well like i mean i do have a relationship with my parents i don't like talking bad about my family they're as supportive as i can ask for um i mean they don't understand but they try to i guess at the best you, you can tell um especially my mom my mom's like my rock um now I hate saying this because like I don't want people to think badly of my dad um so I do hate bringing this up all the like a lot but I mean I'm over it and I've gone through enough therapy with about it I mean my dad's never been to therapy he knows that like when it's ready I'm even willing to pay for it I've got it hooked up if he wants to I've hooked him up um with therapy before he just never went um he but like I'm 29 and when he comes to visit like I get that seven-year-old scared little girl feeling again <laughs> and it's like I mean we still have our battles because like he does know that part of my PTSD involves him um so I can't help it like what PTSD it's just something it actually changes your brain, your frontal lobe in your brain. So it's taken me a long time to explain this to him. And that like sometimes I'll react and it's not even my fault. It's just something's happened. And like, I mean, we have a good relationship as much as possible now. But yeah, it's good because like your kids aren't gonna grow up. I'm 29 years old. I get that scared feeling, right? <laughs> Like, I feel like I'm like, gosh, it's like being scared all over again, a seven-year-old little girl. Yeah, I mean, I've um, I've said it on previous episodes. I mean, it's it's not as if I don't shine a light on my own upbringing and stuff, but um, that's why I knew from an early age that when I became a parent, I, I knew kind of, didn't matter what el- whatever else happened in life with work, jobs and relationships, but. I just knew that I'd be a good parent in that sense because of the poor upbringing that I had. So my children would never know that side. Um, so my my upbringing exactly. itself, like we, my brother and my sister, so my, my sister's older, my brother's younger, all three of us have nothing to do with oh. our parents due to the upbringing that we had. Um, they're still here as far as we know. Like I, like I said, I've not spoke to them in decade easily um but yeah they're, they're still alive as far as i'm aware from different conversations with remainder of the family that still speak to them and stuff but yeah my dad were a violent alcoholic um my mother wasn't so much she didn't suffer with any substance abuse that we were aware of as children and stuff but she just wasn't the sort of person that should have had a child let alone three our mom should get together <laughs> but in that sense don't have children but in, in that sense that obviously like you've said that you you still have that that relationship with your parents i think it's good it's just it's one of them situations if we were to sit like wherever over in canada over in the uk and we're sitting and we have a conversation and it went into everything that went off like people would understand why there is yeah. not only no contact from myself but obviously the rest of my siblings as well that they really weren't any type of parents as it what, what whereas in your case obviously you've still kept you still maintained them relationships as such because obviously our circumstances were different it was their behavior that were 
being projected onto me, whereas obviously yours has shaped itself based on obviously yeah, your, your trauma from when you were younger. Um, but it's been, like you've said on one of other episodes, it's very much any f- relationship with your family has been affected solely because of the substance abuse. And that's part and parcel of obviously going through it as well, that you have to a- acknowledge that you've caused her, you've caused pain to other family members as well as yourself and the physical implications. But my dad would sit here and said to both of us, I, I, I don't care. <laughs> and it's them sort of things that I'm talking about. I see that's the problem though where I did a podcast where we talked about this I had a lot to say about people like that like your father who um did, I'm not sure did he ever get clean or he was just an alcoholic for life he was an alcoholic for life yeah or, yeah as far as far as I was like, aware teenage years onwards um but came from a very good flight there was the rest of his siblings there were nobody else that acted out or behaved like he did it just that's just the way it went he never went for therapy yeah. he always even to this day i believe he still claims that he's an, a recovering alcoholic but he's always propping up a bar and getting thrown out of a pub later on that night so he's not exactly a recovering alcoholic if that's the case uh, so i mean i'll tell you right now i was not a very nice person when i was even I don't even want to think about the things that I've said to my mom, right? And like, um, I mean, yeah, I've gone through it. I've thrown away lots of friendships and relationships because of alcohol. So I have to say, yeah, I know you aren't a nice person when you're drinking. I'll tell you right now. And when you're in addict mode, like that's number one. Like I was very selfish. And, and until you're out of it and until you can admit it, And honestly, sometimes I wonder, like, if I would still be like that because I was forced into rehab, right? Like, I went to rehab before and never took it seriously, right? Like, I went to rehab just before I went, got uh, admitted to the concurrent disorder program in Ontario. I went to another program um, and I just went to make people happy, right? Yeah. Uh, It doesn't mean I was a different person. I'm still like trying at, like I said I tried another drug that I never tried and another addiction while I was in the washroom going for detox for another you know it just doesn't make sense yeah so, kind of have to wake up like I had the gastrologist standing inside my bed being like you need surgery I'm not even touching you because what's the point and you kind of die if you don't change and Come back to me if you get sober. Like he really, I mean, he wasn't like he was cold. Didn't have a good bedside manner. <laughs> I thought, like that's what I needed. Like I was gonna die, and not just that. I mean, I was formed. Right, you can't leave the hospital when you're formed. I've been in and out so many times, and uh, I'm not sure about the UK, um, but in Canada we have two different mental health boards, so you can go to the regular one, which everyone goes to, but then there's the pick which is all padded walls and everything like for angry people or people going through just like, you know, smashing their head. And I always woke up there, never got told why, never woke up with bruises. So I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I don't know. It's like your dad just needs, cause I, sometimes I wonder if I'd still be there if it wasn't for that. Yeah, um, it, it could very well be. Um, it's just it's hard even for me going into the field now um it's hard for me to think of myself being registered and having to sit and have a conversation with him because i just know that there's no there's no accountability on his side in terms of anything that he did when he was yeah. obviously because nine times out of ten any sort of the violent bouts that were occurring that were projected onto me and my brother and sister and even my mum um yeah. happened when he it happened more so when he wasn't drinking when he were necessarily yeah. able to drink um like I, i've told i've told my friends okay. it quite a lot before the uh one of the oh, one of the worst times was um he'd gone on i think it was like a four-day drinking bender as they call them over in uk 
Um, and then he came back because he'd run just solely because he'd run out of money. He came back into the house. He found all the Christmas presents that my mum had bought for the kids and then took them round the local houses selling the presents so he could have money and then went straight to the pub straight after he'd done that. And it were these sorts of things that... But again, she she never helped matters. She she stayed with him when she had enough opportunities, enough outlets to get away from it. She had a very supportive family around on her side who were always sort of saying, look, stay with us, bring kids with us. You don't need to stay there. But yeah we were never removed from that situation um i don't believe to my knowledge social um social services were called in regards to our upbringing but i think if they knew about what was going off we'd have been taken away from them easily yeah no children's aid came to my school in elementary school and i have my own thoughts on them because I mean, you can't go and ask a kid at school. They've been told what to tell you, you right? <laughs> like, yeah, come on. yeah. <laughs> like, I'm going to listen to you over my parent. <laughs> like, you know, it's just. <laughs> yeah, and that, that were very, yeah, it was that, that's very much as our case were in that situation. Um, we just kind of, yeah, we went with it. We, you know, as you'd imagine now schools and obviously, you know, if they see a mark on a child straight away, they'll be asking questions. Whereas obviously back in nineties, eighties, it would, people would just assume no. oh, they've, they've probably just fallen on the bike. They wouldn't even then think, Oh, well they had a bruise there yesterday and it's got bigger or they've now got another bruise. There were, there were none of this kind of like, yeah. Oh, maybe well, we should pay more attention to the welfare of the child kind of thing. Yeah, see, it was hard because I was a competitive figure skater, so always had <laughs> bruises on me. Yeah, that's um, that that's kind of the same with me. I was the traditional boisterous boy when I was younger, always climbing trees, falling out of trees, trying to get conkers from conker trees, or playing football. Um, and then it obviously going into teenage years, I was inline skating. So, I were, yeah, same as yourself, I was always covered in bruises. So, it probably never made things easier for anybody to spot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, when obviously I, I know on previous podcasts that I've seen that you've been on, and you've talked about your experience of when. Over, over here in the UK, they call it uh, when you're sectioned, either voluntary or involuntary, um, where they keep you in on ward until they think that you're healthy enough to go back into sort of society as it would be. You've obviously spent time on wards. What's, what's your experience? I know it's different in Canada, but what is your experience of while you've been there? Okay, so <laughs> I've been to a lot in Ontario 11 out of the lives yeah so I'm not sure how many hospitals are in Ontario I'm gonna tell you I've been to a lot 11 and uh, there's obviously a difference between all the hospitals I can go through them all and I've had horrible experiences at some um great at others um now there's only a few I remember going to the hospital um, and I've been taken by ambulance. Most of the time it was police though, like called for mental health and then police show up. Um, and I remember, I actually remember this. I was like really like, I should not have been, I should not remember this, but I do remember. And I know it, that it, this happened, but I actually, cause I've never had a bad experience with a cop. And like, I do have to say like, because a lot of people do have them. I'm sure it's white, young, female, right? But um, I remember having a conversation because she didn't want to put me in the back of the car, but she had to by law and handcuff me. Um, but she said, she told me herself that they don't get one course in the police, police academy on mental health, yet they are the people that are on the front line of it, right? Yep. So, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, wanted to say that so like ambulance has never take, I think the ambulance only took me twice and I've been multiple times I've any other time it's been the police um 
but I didn't know you could go to the hospital, sorry, involuntarily in the UK. Yeah. And they'll, and they'll like hold you. Yeah. If, um, as if, if you've got them different patients where who are quite outspoken about what they've been trained to do, um, in regards to obviously if they've been trying to take the life, if they've, um, if they talk about the feelings, then they regard that as involuntary in that sense. But as you know, with any healthcare service, it's always evolving to change the terms all the time. Every year, the change. Um, yeah, I was like, wait, I guess you can say that you can do that here, but you're not going to hold you, I'll tell you that. Yeah. They'll make you sit in the waiting room. It's for a quite, few hours. It's quite um, funny that you uh, that you said that about the uh, the female officer that obviously that dealt with you because when I had my university interview during the COVID, it had to be done over Zoom. So one of the questions that I was asked was, um, you get asked like three questions as part of your interview process, and one of the questions I was asked was, um, you've just um, you've just received a patient that's highly irate. Um, but it's the police that's dropped them off at the ward itself. The police haven't really got any information as to what's wrong with the person. They're just saying that they can't deal with them. They're not dealing with someone like this. They keep going into bouts of rage and they've had uh, mental health issues previously. So we've just brought them here. And it, it speaks volumes that, that, again, that it's it's not the fault of the officer. It's the training that they're not given in terms of knowing how to separate somebody that's maybe just drunk or under the influence of substances or are angry about the situation and not being listened to at that moment when they've been arrested. And then yeah. thirdly, obviously, the one where if they have got pre-existing, I mean, that's a large, broad spectrum to say, oh, you know, they, they've got previous mental health issues. But what exactly does that mean? That could just be depression. It doesn't mean a violent outburst. It doesn't mean schizophrenia, bipolar. It's quite broad just to say to the to the patient, uh, to sorry, the ward um, sister when you're coming in is, oh, they've got previous instances of mental health, so this is the best place for them. Mm, not exactly the case. So, like, the car, I mean... Uh, another time a cop like I had a cop that came pick me up but his mom ended up being an alcoholic so like he was very very nice with me had good conversations he actually waited with me in the hospital until the crisis work came um never even got his name but I, but I remember speaking to that female and she was just like ma'am we don't know what to do like we're not trained I've never I don't have a mental health or in my family I've never seen it until I was on the job and the only reason why it was brought up until, because I didn't know this until afterwards, this part I forget, is um, I wasn't dressed appropriately, probably just wearing like my pajamas or something. And they, they told me I'm probably gonna be held. So go downstairs and get like what you need. Um, the officers, because I had already taken a bottle, like so I had already uh, was overdosing and uh, the cops wanted to follow me and watch me change. But my parents, my mom freaked out because of my PTSD. She didn't want the cops going down there and watching me because she thought it would make me freak out yeah. and then like escalate the situation. So the cops didn't end up coming down, uh, but that's what she was explaining. And that's why she was explaining that to me in the car. I found out and made, put the pieces together after. And I was like, yeah, they have no training. They don't know what to do. Like yeah. for all she knows, I could have gone down there and taken another or walk, right? Yeah, and so. I mean, this is this is another one of them branch off conversations that we're talking about where you hope after the pandemic that because things are improving in that sense that there's more conversations going on, that you hope that people, first responders like police officers across the world are given some form of training, even induction training as such, to deal with the possibility of, of differentiating between someone you know that's drunk, someone that's dealing with substance abuse, someone that's genuinely got a mental health condition, bipolar, schizophrenia, things like that, that hopefully they'll be able to, because let's not forget that the, the, the first point of any emergency service response is to calm the person down who they're responding to so they can try and figure out what's actually going off. If you've got no level of understanding like that female, again, through her own, you know, it's not her fault. She wasn't given the training, but if 
they aren't given the training. We, we're not giving ultimately the person they're responding to the right level of support they might need. Yeah, exactly. And not just that, like, afterwards I thought about it. I'm like, like she was a nice cop too. Like, it probably really stresses her out because she does, like, it's her job. She doesn't know what she's doing. She's not trained for it. Like, she's probably more stressed than me, the drunk person was, right? Like, so, I mean, I can definitely see why we have so many bad mental health situations with cops, like, no training all of a sudden, you know, she's just like, could be, uh, yeah, she could just like get scared, you know, and react wrongly. But yeah, anyways, I think the whole, like you said, a whole other topic, they need to be trained. At least one course, one course, just one. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I suppose, I mean, we've, we've, we've sort of shared these comments with each other over different, when we, each one of us are doing different posts on our social medias, but I suppose it's it all depends in terms of obviously how each mental health or you know national health service as it would be is dealing or is responding to things that way because there's got to be a ideal there's got to be a set way of dealing with it. Don't matter what country you're in, don't matter what continent, where you are in the world, it should all be dealt with in one one way. But you've got to get so many people together to have that conversation for them to agree that this is the one response that's global response, what we should have when something's identified. And hopefully we get there, but I think there's a lot more conversation still to be had. Like, I'm not sure in the UK, but if there's an accident with an animal in it, like, I don't even know if you have an SPCA, like, um, like uh, just like a government funded animal shelter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We've, yeah. We've got similar. Yeah. They send them to um, car accidents to save the animal if there's an animal in a car accident. See, we we don't even have that. We we have we have the RSPCA, but it's a, it's a non profit organization. Even though oh. it it does get a lot of funding, but it is it's the nation's kind of non profit. Oh. Like. But yeah, uh. even to them situations like. You would need someone on scene, uh, whether it were a police officer, bystander, who, if it were involving an animal, who would have to make that call. I don't think there's a set practice, like you said, oh, for no. Canada. This is like Canada. Like we send like SPCA. <laughs> they get man to the scene to save the animal. Um, like even our firefighters, they have like the oxygen tanks for cats and dogs on all the trucks. No way. How social worker to go to a mental health call. <laughs> <laughs> blows my mind away but we can get the SBCA right there yeah but I suppose yeah it, it comes down to all the politics that I think you've got people that in suits that are, that are sat there having conversations without even speaking to the you know the boots on the ground as we call it where you know speaking to your actual nurses you ones who are dealing with these things speaking to people who are you know previously diagnosed with issues or are currently dealing with things because that, that was quite beneficial as well, to go back to my interview. I didn't know at the time. It wasn't until after my interview finished. One of the ladies who was sat there asking me the questions, she's still under care at the minute with the NHS for mental health conditions. She's only, at that point, she'd only been out four weeks from one of these wards that she was on. And the university thought it were a good idea, obviously with her agreeing to it, to be one of the people sitting there and kind of saying this person, even though they're only coming to on to do a three-year degree and they're not actually going to be registered at this point, but it'd be good to have you guys come in because you know what you're looking for in terms of what you think is someone who's who'd be good in the profession or not. So I thought that were a nice touch to have them come in in that sense. I do. I do like that. Um because when I was at Waypoint, they have like, it's a massive facility. Um, it's uh, the only concurrent disorder in Ontario too, which now it's closed down. I was the last graduate, I have the last certificate. <laughs> but um, there was like a whole separate part too, where like the, um, where all the managers and like who ran the place were all like counting and everything. And like, I could never find the gym for some reason. And I, 
ended up in, in this like um, going to gym class and I ended up in in the management area and they took me in and they thought I was there for an interview <laughs> in here like management, no clue no clue about what's going on in their building okay that's quite funny <laughs> it's like two months into the program I still couldn't find a gym <laughs> um there were there were another point that you'd brought up in uh, I think it was the same podcast that I was listening to that I've, I think a lot of people overlook and don't see how crucial it could actually be when you when you spoke uh, you spoke at length to be fair about um food intake and how that can affect the you know the um, your mood your behavior um yeah, what sort of things have you found while well, you've, you've been doing your research and, you know, in terms of the good foods or the foods to stay away from? Okay. Okay. So basically, I know that recovery does make you gain weight. And it's frustrating and people do get really self-conscious and we do have to remember our self-esteem. As soon as it goes low, we've got a chance. We're closer to a relapse or slip, right? Yep. So instead of starving ourselves and trying to lose weight, I started to look into like healthy foods, but then I started looking into how foods also affect different things like alcohol. I only have one kidney now. I'm also not on meds, but I eat food that keep my kidneys in good shape and clean my blood. And um, there's a lot of foods like I'm cutting down on meds right now because I know you look guys, you have your meds paid for. But yeah. my meds cost about a thousand a month here, yeah. a thousand a month. I'm trying to cut down here and um, sleep. So like sleep, uh, I've tried every sleeping med there is. Um, the only things that can get me to sleep are benzos, which I try to stay away from. So like foods, uh, don't eat heavy meals. But then there's also foods that can help induce sleep. Like we know turkey induces sleep. Like you eat a big turkey meal and you get tired, right? So there's certain foods that do that. There's certain foods like um, I eat red onion now every day. Um, I'm pretty sure it's helped too. Um, love red onion. But it actually, if you start eating it um, at the right time and then you eat it every day, it can actually stop you from getting depression like scientifically proven so eat those every day um spinach is a great mood stabilizer and it's also no it doesn't have much flavor sorry i'm not a very just shove that in somewhere and eat with a hot with a high flavor so like um i don't even know i'll mix it in with fried rice and just make sure that fried rice is spicy i want to taste that spinach um, <laughs> and then yeah so I mean there's things you can do walnuts they're really good for the brain I always have walnuts and flower seeds now so yeah I mean there's like 20 different superfoods for your brain and oh and also like foods can help with cravings too found out about that so like or I always have bananas on me because they're really helpful with alcohol cravings so yeah it is a lot of people naturally when you talk about substance abuse whether it's alcohol drugs a lot of people just automatically and then the, it leads on to like mental health uh, illnesses and conditions where people just think the only way to combat that is medication it's just the only way but it's not there's, there's so other so other different out there's so many other different avenues you know changing up your diet um they, they say that at best of times for everything like you change if, if you if you're living an unhealthy life the if you improve it by eating healthier, uh, exercising in some form or another, that'll help change your mood drastically and your outlook compared to before when you weren't doing that. So, yeah, like you can't just take meds and your mental health get like immediately better. Um, you can't just stop drinking and all of a sudden everyone loves me. I'm not selfish anymore. Like, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, it's a process. Like, I'm still in it. I'm over 18 months sober now. Like, I do an hour of CBT and DBT um, workbooks every day. I do mindfulness exercises every day. 
that is just to keep my my anxiety down so I don't have to take meds for that um I am constantly learning coping skills like I look them up all the time I'm always reading about them um so I'm 29 and I want to build my toolbox right like yeah. I'm only 29 I got a lot of years to live hopefully um so and then and yeah I am hopeful now so I mean, I'm going to obviously be going through stuff in those years. I need to have coping skills so I don't end up back here or back there again, right? Um, well, you took a very big step as well, didn't you? You moved. Uh, I don't. I can't remember how long how long ago you moved now, but you you moved from the bustling city as it would be to literally to that beautiful scenery that's around you. Um, yeah. So that as well, that as you know, taking yourself away from maybe those friendship, those relationships that you had at that point that were feeding the addictions in that sense, that you took yourself away from them and just to the quiet, just so you can take a step back and just have a breath away from stuff. So I really like they brought that up because I think that moving is a huge part of recovery and they don't actually say that in all the rehab programs I've ever been to. They've never made that a huge thing. They just want go home after right yeah. um out of 19 out of us that graduated during my term at waypoint i'm the only one sober and alive right now wow. that i know uh so i mean no one else moved and if you ever watch intervention or watch anything from the states they always put you in like sober living places so you're not going home yeah or you find like they always move somewhere else you have to and it's not even that it's not even it's it's just the fact that like majority of us that have gone through substance abuse like we have trauma and there are certain places in your immigration that like even if i were to go to like it's just traumatizing and i don't know like doing that every day again like i don't know if my brain can handle that like yeah i have coping skills and stuff but maybe it might not eventually work yeah most definitely those because they the say don't know those people that stay in them situations are there might be like just like you said the sober living houses that they put you in you can only stay there for so long and then you have to at some point go somewhere but those people that do go back it's kind of just a ticking time but they're gonna go back to what you know what led them to that path and stuff you doing what you've done and taking yourself away from it but in, an, in another sense, though, you, like you've leveled up from where you were because, you know, I'd imagine the scenery and, and the place where you're living now, in comparison to where you were before, yeah. the bustling city and stuff, like I, I would take your scenery now that you've got over the city any day of the week, any day of the oh, week. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, like, also... Again, COVID, like a lot of people couldn't handle COVID. Um, first day I got out of rehab, um, I left with someone and he actually ended up overdosing that day dying. Um, and it was just because like, and I still think to it, I'm like, I don't know, like even if I just, the Narcan work that day or like, you know, because I was there and like, yeah, I don't think he, <clears throat> Sorry, I don't think you could have handled living in COVID world. No. And honestly, like, I don't think that's why I came here because I'm like, I don't really have to face it here. Like, I can still go out. I go for walks and, you know, go kayaking, even going to the grocery store. I mean, I'm in a city of like 200. Like, if I go to the grocery <laughs> store, there's like many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's. It's one of them things as well, like me and Chris, who obviously we, we co-founded Jukebox Jacks, we we constantly like, because we're on different time zones, yourself and, and us, that usually when we get up on a morning, it's usually you've took pictures from midway through your day kind of thing, and you'll be on lake, you'll be with them beautiful dogs, those huskies. Um, <laughs> there'll just be loads of different things going on, and it's just it's a nice way to wake up to see those things like it 
it, I don't know, it puts a kind of spring in our step in that sense of if we were in your situation and we were seeing that every day, we can understand how the well-being you provide in yourself and the positivity that it's instantly better without you being in city, without you being near those people, those those things that have presented themselves in situations where it can lead you down different paths and stuff. So, yeah, even us just seeing through, obviously, rose-tinted window, we can kind of see a big difference in the situation and the environment that you've put yourself in compared to where you were. Yeah, and it also really helps, like, in addiction, you don't take care of yourself, right? Like, I've had to do therapy with my mom because, like, she ha- she was almost addicted to, like, taking care of me. Like, it was, like, having a baby. <laughs> Yeah, I'm to feed them, make sure their laundry's done. Like, you know, I couldn't do anything for myself. So it was like almost codependency issues there. Yeah. Um, so being here has been really good too for both of us because like she kind of almost has a life back again. Um, <laughs> as dogs herself, she has a group of ladies that she used to dog walk with and she's like rejoined. And so I'm very happy about that. But then being up here by myself, like, holy crap, I can actually like cooking my myself and like I can vacuum and like I can make sure that like I things I need are done like that that's a huge confidence booster too like right is I always thought I needed to be taken care of no I can take care of myself yeah yeah because there's there's obviously being in a city and obviously everything being at the edge of your dorm and things like that to literally like when people actually check out your social medias and stuff, which obviously they've been coming up throughout this obviously podcast, but those people listening, the links are going to be on the description of the episode on Spotify, head over and check out Michelle's um, Instagram. Um, Some of the things that she shares and some of the scenery, like you'll understand what we're talking about. Like the the picture, I I don't know if you put it on your story or if it was a picture where, you actually went out on kayak and you caught your food for that night, fish. Oh, yeah. I have, I keep all my stories all saved. Like it's my journey of recovering. I see it. I'm saving it all. So you can still see it. Yeah. So the situation like that, you know, when we talk about obviously doing things for yourself and having a sense of independence, which you never thought you'd have, it, it's taken to even yeah. another avenue where you're going out on a kayak and you're catching your own food. You're cooking it you're not even having to uh, rely on like supermarkets and stores and things like that well that that the farthest you the closest superstore to me or like any kind of grocery store is about 45 minute drive one way so i also don't have natural gas lines that come out here so i actually don't have wi-fi either um i just have like data on my phone and my tablet but i have to get oil deliveries for my furnace and then that's really expensive so all winter i have um a fireplace and i cut wood and i heat the place with fire but but it's all which is good exercise yeah that's what i was gonna say it's all things like that isn't it it's obviously you're having to you're having to physically get yourself through each day as opposed to just being sat somewhere in a city in an apartment with varying different things boredom setting in what do i do more likely to go you know have a relapse and things whereas where you are now you're always on the go you're always doing stuff but don't get me wrong sometimes obviously you just have you wake up that day and you're just like i really just want to stay in and relax all day and not do anything but yeah. You 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 can deal with that as an individual. You don't beat yourself up about it because you know for the past fifteen days you've covered so many miles doing different things. Yeah, exactly. And the weather up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To be fair, when I was checking out the um, obviously the the time difference between us and things like that, um, yeah, you've got some sunny days ahead of you, like from tomorrow onwards. I mean, I don't look at that. It changes, like, <laughs> hourly. Um, but the wind up here is absolutely ridiculous. Like, the other day, it was completely sunny, and then it just went into, like, a huge downpour and windstorm. And a tree, like, I just heard a huge boom and a tree from across. Like, I'm in a channel, so there's um, an island right across. Fell, and it, the whole tree, it almost crushed someone's boat because the tree was, like, as long as the whole channel. And they wow. had to come like pull it all down and get it out of the way right 
Ja, ik heb het niet. <laughs> Even paradise as, as it is off days. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. I have no bugs though when it's one of these. That's very true. Um, I suppose in closing, I was just gonna uh, I was just gonna ask if you've got any kind of feedback in terms of obviously from your experience that you've had, you know, dealing with mental health professionals and things like that. If there's things that you'd like to see changed in terms of how current care plans are put together and things, into even if it's simple things like them listening to patients more in terms of obviously what they need and things like that. Um, I'm going to say one, because COVID, I think governments are pretty much maxed out right now for budgets. So, um, this whole, like all this money going into mental health, it's not going to happen. And, you know, we can see why. Um, so one, I want to see children, children need to learn how to deal with coping skills. Like they deal with frustrations and being angry and outbursts. They need to know emotional regulation so one children okay um two the medical field just knowing concurrent disorder okay that i if i went in with just mental health i got treated a lot differently than if the doctor knew more about my history and my addiction like there's one time where i went in they saw the narcan kit just tested me for drugs even though i was formed by the doctor i worked for he formed me. All they did was saw the Narcan kit, tested me. I tested negative for opiates at that point because it wasn't my DOC at that time. And they sent me home and I attempted suicide that night. So I don't want that to happen. Yep. You go together and let's not judge it. And then the other thing is, I mean, you guys are okay for this, but meds, man in Canada are so expensive. Like who can afford a thousand dollar a month meds, right? So we need to figure that out. Like when I left Waypoint and realized I was on a thousand dollar worth of meds, like, yeah, that definitely needs to change. Something needs to happen there. Like some sort of reform with it, you know, a, a change of it. It's, it's clearly, like you say, it's clearly not, it's not working and it's, but you got to think of those, even though obviously people like yourself that where you're paying from, you've got to think of those individuals that genuinely can't afford even a hundred dollars as it would be to pay for whatever. That's like two hundred and twenty-one dollars a month. My ADHD men. There's yeah, there's there's got to be some sort of reform that can be done, and all we can do is is hope and pass these obviously these things back. Um, I'm not going to ask you the uh, the bigger picture uh, question uh, because as we both know, uh, you as well as other people find it more manageable to just take it a day at a time and see where yeah. you're at and embrace any type of setback that you have and just take it with you know a pinch of salt and tomorrow's the new day and yesterday's gone and it's all it's all starting again from tomorrow. So, but thank you for taking time out. It's been great, as I know it would be. Connection mm -hmm. hasn't even failed us that much, to be fair. Yeah, I know. It's a nice day here, so you got good luck. <laughs> but no, I, I honestly, I can't thank you enough. Um, I've been looking forward to this episode. And just like I've said to a few of the guests as well that I've had, we'll, uh, we'll touch base with you again because I'm going to be getting unindated with questions and they're going to end up following, obviously, your journey as well. And, and they might have individual questions about different things coming up and... You're extremely approachable, same as herself. So, uh, yeah, it's good to sit down and have this uh, this conversation with you. Well, it was good. Good. I'm a <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'll um, I'll not take up any more of your time. I'll uh, I'll stop this uh, podcasting session now. Uh, I'll just give a shout out to uh, to us listeners. Uh, don't forget the um, the merchandise um, is out. Fingers crossed. Uh, this time next week, where um, seventy-five percent of the proceeds that are generated from any sales of merchandise and such go straight to mental health charities in the UK. Um, if you like, obviously, what you're hearing, you're interested in being a guest, send us a 
an email across. We will try and get back to you as quick as possible. Um, we've got podcasts booked in until middle of 2022 at this point. Um, I don't even know how I'm going to find time to do my degree in all honesty, but we'll, uh, we'll make it work somehow. We'll make it work. But thank you for listening. Thank you, Michelle. Everybody uh, head over, check her out. Um, there'll be loads of social links coming up throughout. Um, but yeah, as always, guys, live your life, be kind and give back. Thanks, guys. Bye. Right.